welcome to another episode of Gur Cafe. I'm your host, Lainey. Join me and my colleagues, Ollie and Seb, as we discuss varying topics around all things games user research. We've got you covered, whether you're just getting started in Gur, been around for a while, or are simply interested in learning more. We have a lot to talk about, so grab your favorite drink and let's jump right in to today's episode. All right, Ollie, hi. Hi, Lenny. How are you doing? I'm doing well. How are you? Uh, very well, thank you. Good. Welcome to our very special episode for the Grux Online Summit. We're super happy today to chat about a little, we're doing a little bit of a different format. Uh, first of all, our, our lovely friend Seb is, uh, is away today, so it's just going to be Ollie and I having a conversation, but looking forward to it. We have many of these, and so it should be just like our usual conversations of chatting about topics that we enjoy. Yep, yep, but Seb, you will be missed. Yes, we will, uh, we'll have Seb next time for sure, so, but topic of today is is a little bit of an interesting one because we're actually going to be discussing a talk that was previously given at the Games UR Summit in 2019 in San Francisco by our colleague Julian. Uh, the name of the talk is How Can We Blend UR Into the Design Cycle? So I'll pause right here really quick. If you have the opportunity to put us on pause and go check out that talk, we highly recommend it. We are going to cover a lot of the high level pieces uh, of the content that Julian discusses, but it's one of my favorite talks. I know Ollie feels the same. Please go check it out. We'll have everything linked for you as well so that you'll know exactly which one to go uh, and talk to and maybe come back or at least go check it out when you're when you're done listening to this. So uh, I, I think I've expressed multiple times uh, to Julian <laughs> my love for this talk. Uh, we used to we worked together back then when he when he was preparing it. Um, and I think I feel I feel like it, I bring it up quite frequently uh, with my team. So it's it's kind of a, a little bit of a talk about kind of influence and being blended into the design cycle. So giving some context, uh, so becoming implicated into the design iteration process is a key piece to long-term UR buy-in and impact. I think we can all, probably all agree to that. And becoming blended with the design cycle is certainly a task easier said than done. Um, oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And before we get into the topic, I actually want to pause to define these two terms because we're going to be talking about embedded, we're going to be talking about being blended, and I want to make sure we understand the difference for our audience here. Um, so when I'm when we're referring to embedded researchers, because typically most of our researchers here at Ubisoft are embedded, this means that they are researchers typically seated physically or virtually uh, with the design team, and they're typically full-time dedicated individuals working on a, a sole project. So working with a particular design team, a certain uh, brand or production. When we're talking about blended, this means it's more being implicated, right? It's being a part of the, of the process, not only just kind of adjacent to it. So being in close proximity does not necessarily mean that you are blended. So embedded does not necessarily mean that you're in blended and you don't have to be embedded to be blended. <laughs> uh, and we can touch That's later. <laughs> yeah. We can we can touch on that a little bit later, especially when we're going to be talking about uh, the more recent impact of COVID and how that's kind of impacted our ability to be blended with our teams to kind of build and maintain relationships. But just wanted to kind of set the, the groundwork of these two different terms so we're not confused as we're discussing. So, Ollie, I'm gonna have you give us a, a little bit of a rundown of some of the topics uh, that, that Julian was discussing in that talk. So let's discuss first some of the current problems that we face as user researchers that are perhaps kind of preventing us from being really blended. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thanks, Lenny. Uh, yeah, and uh, yeah, of course, I'm going to uh, kind of paraphrase some of the talk content. So again, uh, go back to it uh, if you want uh, to have uh, the, the, the full presentation. Um, 
But yeah, uh, one of the 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 the, the first aspect that uh, Julien uh, is mentioning in his talk is uh, how our our tendency to arrive uh, too late sometimes uh, in the production cycle to be uh, really impactful, and. <clears throat> To be honest, it's not just a game user research problem. It's, I mean, uh, the being too late uh, in the development cycle is, I believe, as old as the user research itself. Uh, but that's certainly something that we keep experiencing uh, in the gaming industry. And um, I think, uh, again, uh, referencing the talk, uh, I, I love the graph that shows, you know, the uh, ROI of the research uh, as compared to uh, where you are in the production and also the level of stress of the production, because that's, that's maybe something that is specific to games as compared to other products. Uh, I'm not sure there's so much stress near to launch when you're launching a website versus launching a game. <clears throat> so it, it adds an additional uh, an additional layer on uh, yeah why uh, yeah testing too late or being too late uh, is not uh, is not the most impactful. So uh, of course first reason being that uh, everything is pretty much set in stone. So uh, if you arrive at that point, uh, even though you have uh, really great insights about how to improve the game, it's very unlikely that the game is going to be changed uh, this deeply anyway. So that's <clears throat> that's really your first thing. And it's there's a reason for that. I mean, it's just, I mean, um, yeah, as, as, you, as you know it, uh, near the end of the production, uh, usually the, uh, the the HQ wants to have visibility on the state of the game. So it makes sense that we do those kind of game assessment very late in production uh, because, yeah, we and we, we should still be doing that at some point. So, uh, but not just that or not just arriving at that moment. Um, so that that's one thing. It's, it's late, but it can also be late in the, the at a more micro level uh, because uh, uh, I think you experience that, uh, Lenny, uh, the, when you uh, offer to uh, uh, do a testing on the gnarly concept and people will tell you, uh, uh, no, but it's not ready yet. I cannot show yep. it to real users because it's not ready yet. So uh, I don't want to know if you want to give examples on that or if I <laughs> shall continue. But, yeah, uh, no, but I think I think it's an interesting one because you think about, and I, and I love the graph that you were referencing that's in Julian's talk because I think it is kind of this, it's, there is this kind of cascading, like we're losing that ability to influence and impact and really become that kind of blended individual that we want to over time. But it's not necessarily that you come in early that like guarantees that you're going to be able to have a lot of uh, influence and impact because there is some kind of education that needs to come into into play when you're coming in early kind of helping people understand that it's not necessarily too early and kind of working through some of that kind of initial stress and anxiety. So I think coming in late is the more kind of classic problem, I think, that many of us face as a more universal way. But it also, like you said, it can be reflected on the flip side of coming in so early if you don't have the experience of working with with uh, the design teams that are accustomed to working with researchers or quote unquote external individuals to get that feedback to not feel like you're dictating the design process. And we're going to touch on that a few times over the course of what we're chatting about today is that it's not about this loss of creativity, right? It's about helping inform and make, help them feel more confident in the decisions that they are making. And we, we see is that as kind of one of the current problems that we're facing if we're coming in too late or we're coming in too early and we're not well positioned or our teams are not prepared to work with us, we can have similar problems, whether we're at the beginning or the end. Yeah, and you know that that makes me think of this uh, famous uh, sentence. You know, uh, test test early, test often. I think yeah. <coughs> it's 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 not a, a wrong sentence, but uh, maybe we should phrase it differently, like. Uh, uh, do research early, do research often, because uh, uh, you know more often than not, user research is associated with testing, and testing yeah. uh, is associated associated sorry with assessing and not yeah. and not helping to design. Right? When we test something, we want to see if it works or if it doesn't work, and that's that's definitely an important part of the process. But uh, sometimes it's the only part or the only way that uh, we uh, collaborate uh, with productions and. Uh, Obviously, when we do that, it means that we don't really have a say about the decisions that, I, that are being made. So 
it's definitely a missed opportunity because yeah, we can tell if what they decided works or doesn't work, but we're missing the spot when it comes to really uh, providing useful information to help them make their decision in the first place. I think it, it touches on a bit of that kind of mentality that, that Julian talks a little bit about this kind of firefighter versus uh, like a builder where you've got this firefighter mentality where you're kind of just a little bit on the outside all the time. Like you're, you've got this kind of sense for maybe I don't understand why this decision is being made or I'm not involved enough to be able to get full understanding as to, well, they didn't fix this issue or they didn't fix this thing. And it feels a little bit like, well, I said that this was a problem. Why, why didn't they address it? And it's kind of how we're presenting ourselves within that space. If we're constantly just there to say like, okay, yeah, like that thing, that thing worked. All right. See you later. Um, maybe that's feeding in a little bit to that and to some extent, I think. Yes, definitely, and uh, we know that uh, that's also um, uh, it's, it's 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 quite uh, common that uh, uh, junior they just want to run tests, you know, because this is yeah. what they've been trained for. So yeah, yeah, I want to run that test. I want to have participants, and I want to uh, to 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 answer that question, etc. But and and that's good. I mean, again, that's an important part of There's the process. There's a place for that. But, but but you know, it's it's yeah, it's it's just it, it's interesting because somehow it's uh, sustain this kind of position that we think we're too much in about the, 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 the validators. Yes. Uh, but at the same time, uh, this is uh, what the juniors want to do that. And I can perfectly understand that because, you know, they, were, they won't like you to, to, to polish their weapons and to learn to do those, uh, those, 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 uh, those methods, etc. But in the end, um, <clears throat> If, if it's just that, uh, I think no one's uh, a winner at the end of the day. I mean, uh, neither the production and neither us, because um, uh, I can per perfectly see, uh, you know, as you were telling, hey, why did why didn't they do uh, this change uh, that I reported since last time? So uh, we have seen that, you know, uh, the, the frustration that it can generate already for the user researcher to have the, the, the feeling that what they are doing is not taken into account, etc., etc. But also probably on the production side, you know, just uh, having this kind of uh, anxiety, as you were telling, and that uh, mm -hmm. Julien is mentioning in the talk that, uh, oh, what are they going to think about my design? And uh, am I going to have a good rating or am I going to have a, 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 a bad rating so mm -hmm. it, it's just a stressful and uh, let's say uh, unsatisfying situation for uh, yeah. everyone I believe uh, when it could be it could be otherwise but yeah. being otherwise means being blended and uh, doing test after test mm -hmm. is not being blended yeah I, you've touched on so many wonderful topics that I want to talk about <laughs> But I think You're I think welcome. one of them <laughs> I think one of them is yeah like it's it's this kind of discussion of comfort almost initially when you're coming in as a junior and you really want to show your stuff. I want to show my methods. I want to do this like really interesting pieces of research and that's fantastic and there's definitely a place for that. And you know, you and I have talked about this. I talk about it with my team all the time. It's like validating things is okay. Coming in and saying like, yes, this thing worked as intended is always going to be okay. But it's about finding that balance between I'm only ever validating decisions versus I'm also being able to come in and provide insights to help, you know, lead discussions and that are going to lead to decision making. And so there's all of these kind of pieces coming together. And I think when you're, it's easy to kind of get stuck in, I'm just kind of, I'm here, I'm doing my methods, I'm doing this, I'm kind of, I'm getting their questions, I'm delivering this thing. And then easy, it's easy to kind of just walk away from that. And I think that often does lead to this kind of stress and anxiety, right? Like having worked with Julian, he and I worked on Siege. He was the, um, the cell owner when I was an analyst on, on Siege. And he would say all the time, and he says it in the talk, like if it's, if it's always stressful, something is wrong and that goes for either side like you said if it's always stressful for your analyst that's not an ideal situation and if it's always stressful for your partners oh i don't know what rating i'm going to get i don't know what this feedback is going to be is it going to be bad is it going to be good you've got some missed opportunities 
and you've got this option for really becoming more blended, right? So it's like if we're continually coming in too late where we're not able to have the impact and the influence, if we're too often ending up being the ones to kind of just strictly validate decisions and we've got this mentality, like this firefighter mentality of it that Julian describes, it's like these are all these kind of qualities of like an unhealthy or like an imbalanced relationship with user research and design. And it's it's because we are, it can be impacted by kind of how we're presenting ourselves and what we're able to do and how, what our role there is, right? There's a lot of education opportunities. And I think, well, obviously we all want to strive for a <laughs> more stress-free relationship uh, with our designers and our partners. And uh, we don't want to be experiencing stress and anxiety on our side when we're running research. We want to understand why changes are being made. We want to ensure that things are being fixed upon when we're bringing up issues. So I want to touch a little bit on then what does good look like? Right, so we've talked on like, okay, what some of the problems that we're facing are, uh, but how do we get to the point where we're able to kind of maybe own or become, you know, own some of this iteration process or become blended? Yeah, and since we are talking about the the the, the testing loop, I think that uh, yeah, a first point that we can bring is that uh, yeah, uh, let's remember that test is not the answer uh, to everything. It should never be. I mean, it's just uh, and uh, again, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's easier said than done because it's also uh, some kind of widely spread stereotype on the productions that uh, this is what the, the the user research labs are doing. They are doing tests. You know, they are doing those. Uh, Play test, you know, a word that I, you know, I don't like that much because uh, <laughs> it means it, 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 it means thing that is a very, let's say, uh, reduced way of uh, describing the research. Yeah. Um, but also because you know uh, they they want some tests, we do some tests, and sometimes it's difficult to 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 extract ourselves from that loop. You know, uh, you you are telling, yeah, of course, we want to do it differently, but sometimes when you're when you are stuck uh, on on that loop, it can get difficult because you're anyway always. Uh, running, running, running to do the next test, so you, you don't even have the bandwidth to, uh, to 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 get out of this. But yeah, yeah. I, I mean, a, a simple thing is just to, to let, let's just remember that uh, test is a tool, and that's just a tool. And we have many tools in our uh, research or toolbox, which is uh, why I love so much that <laughs> uh, our craft. It's because you know uh, there's so much way to 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 answer a question, and and uh, again, it's just switching from that uh, what research am I going to run to what insight do they need uh, to, to make that decision and what do, what do they need them uh, is I think uh, a good starting point because uh, maybe you're more thinking about uh, what's going on in the production than uh, what method do I have to put in place and uh, what are my participants going to look like. Um, I mean th these are just means to uh, to, 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 to to produce what the, the production needs, but first we need to understand what the production needs. And sometimes we kind of not fail that step, that step, but may, maybe don't have all the conversations that are uh, required to uh, to get a full understanding and visibility on how we can be most efficient to our mm -hmm. stakeholders. And I think it's difficult too when you're when you are a little bit fresher and newer in the job as a researcher to feel really confident with all of these methods that are in your toolkit, right? You kind of like roll up on the production, you got your big toolbox and you're just like, all right, now what? <laughs> it's trying to kind of figure yeah, out true. like, okay, so I've got all these things and I've got these different things that I can do. And it feels in, it feels very counterintuitive to say, don't start doing research yet. Cause like, that's what you were there for. And like, that's what your job is, <laughs> yeah, right. but it's like, no, just go talk to people. Just go understand, right? It's, we need to understand where we are, where we want to be, but we also really need to understand where we've come from. And that's regardless of the, of the state of the game that you're on, right? It's that if you're trying to continue to, if you're coming in at any point in during the production conception, whatever the de game development cycle, it's really important to be able to understand where where you are and how that fits in. And 
that's how you're really becoming that a partner, right? You're not just becoming this like support role where it's like, okay, here I am. Tell me what to do. Tell me what to test. It's looking at, okay, so I'm, I'm giving more consideration to kind of what's going on around me. And I'm thinking about, okay, how do I use my, the tools in my toolkit more efficiently? And maybe I'm not using as many as I thought I was going to use sometimes, but it's, kind of becoming more involved in some of these conversations and making sure that we are utilizing them as efficiently as possible when we are running a test. Yeah, and you, you are saying how we can become partners, but uh, I, I would I, I would dare to go one step further, but I think that we somehow need to become part of the team. We, we, we yes. need to become part of the production team because um, <clears throat> uh, I remember from discussion I had with uh, analysts in the past, uh, it's, I heard a couple of times saying, oh, yeah, they're seeing us as a part of the team. They told us you are part of the team, you know, and, and, and I think when, when you reach that level of collaboration, uh, then uh, it's Maybe not be perfect, but that's at least you're not the, the service anymore. You are really someone yeah. working with the team and they feel that you have the same drive that they do to uh, make the project a success and the game a success, etc. And it, change, it changes a lot the, the kind of discussion that you can have with them because then uh, when you become a, a trusted partner or kind of a team member, uh, I think that people open up way more about their challenges, what they yes. are trying to do, what they need to address, etc. And this is the gold mine that you need to have access to to uh, be the most relevant in your work. I think you're also able to anticipate some of those challenges as well when you're yeah. really when you're really there to be able to be involved in the conversations and see where they're going, what the decisions are being taken and you know and that's 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 what this kind of blended definition is that we're really discussing. It's you know when Julian's in his talk, he's talking a little bit about blended as kind of like owning this kind of portion of the iteration process. And I think owning some aspect of the design cycle, right? And I think that can manifest in a lot of different ways and it's going to depend on the game, you know, the, the product, the cell, the individuals, the the researcher. And I think it can it can look a lot differently kind of depending on your own individual experience as well. If you're a little bit newer, a little bit more junior in the role, that can be maybe being a bit more of a discussion facilitator in some of these things. Maybe you're involved in a design workshop and you're kind of helping moderate that discussion with some of the designers and some of the directors and other individuals from the team. If you're more of a senior level role, maybe it's just sitting in director's review meetings and providing insights and asking questions, right? It's influence isn't only about having answers, it's about asking the right questions and getting people to think about things in a different way. And so it's not this like one stop, one kind of way of doing it. It's, it, there is that level of flexibility there as well. So I think the most interesting thing that we can chat a little bit about now is kind of, okay, I think we're all in agreement that this is like a really good thing, but like, how do we get there? How do we get to the point where we're able to be moving past kind of these support characters and we're more into the partners where we are more blended and maybe we have this more kind of healthy relationship, but how, how do we do that with our teams? Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I mean, you 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 hinted a little of it. I think uh, in what you said, uh, it's uh, and uh, again, uh, yeah, we're going to talk again about the importance of of communication that we already uh, discussed uh, in a, in a previous episode. But uh, yeah, uh, when you join the project, don't. So don't rush to know when you are going to do your first test or your first piece of research. It's uh, it's talking first. It's, it's understanding where you are, understanding the the, the, the context, and uh, um, as uh, intimidating it can uh, look to maybe more uh, junior people, it can be as simple as just you know taking around and uh, seeing a designer and say hey hello, uh, introduce yourself and say hey what are you working on? Uh, oh, you're working on that part, and uh, how does that work with the game? Just just being curious, you know. Um, yeah. 
pe people like it when uh, when someone is interested in their uh, job. So uh, uh, I, I won't see people telling you, no, I don't want to tell you about my job. Uh, I mean, <laughs> I don't say it never happens, but usually people are interested. Yeah, and that's, for sure. And, and that's a nice way to, uh, to, to, to create some kind of bond. You know, they, they need to understand that uh, we are genuinely interested in uh, what they are trying to achieve and that we are first uh, uh, not just coming and say, hey, we should test this, but just trying to understand what they do and uh, what are their challenges, what are the uncertainties that they have, the directions, etc. Um, it, it's super interesting because uh, even from those conversations, you can tr start to identify yourself uh, possibilities for research yes. or things that where you believe that yeah your skills might be helpful because um, again we, we we can't expect from my stakeholders to uh, know when and how to do research because otherwise we wouldn't have a job right so yep. uh, yeah it's, it's also up to us to say hey you know oh you're asking your question you know that <clears throat> if we did this little piece of research, I could bring you insight about that. That could be a starting point, you know, to, uh, to, 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 to try to get on board and that they see you as uh, the person that helps and not the person that gives the rating. Yeah, and, it's the, and it goes, I think, really nicely into providing that consistent level of support. You know, you're not just kind of coming in at a peak and where things get stressful and then kind of going away. It's these constant conversations. It's like, yeah, you know what? We can run like a small internal thing. I can do a review. I can go ask a couple people what they think. We can sit down and have a play session, have a play test, an internal thing. And that's super helpful to build trust with the with those individuals, like you were saying. I think it also really helps fight that test anxiety that we see a lot when you kind of are coming and going and maybe they don't see you very often and you come in and then suddenly you have like this 90 page user test report. Yeah, yeah okay. Uh, but it, it helps kind of remove that surprise effect of, you know, here we are, we can do a lot of different things, help educate them on what we can do. You know, it's, it's this education, it's the evangelism, it's building those relationships with the team. It, help set expectations of what our role is and how we can help them because if you just go in you're like yeah we can we can get feedback from people on on any of your pieces of content that you would like it's really difficult for somebody to decide like okay well how do i know when it's ready how do i know who i need to talk to uh do i need to decide what the questions are that you ask do i need to set the you know how, how are you going to do this are they going to play do i have to like think of questions that we're going to ask them it, it allows you to kind of guide that narrative almost with them and help them kind of understand the different ways in which you can provide that assistance. And maybe it is, you know, running the internal play sessions. That's a good example that, that Julian uses during the talk. And that was something that was uh, pretty big for us back on Siege like many years ago was that was how we became that's how we built really healthy relationships with our design teams was really taking ownership of this play session process that they were already doing and we felt like oh well if we just come in and we tweak just small little bits and they get more and more and more comfortable with us we can actually leverage that in a lot of really different and unique ways and it allowed us to get very creative right there's obviously there's a lot of people that are probably listening who are screaming thinking like these internal play sessions have a lot of inherent bias and all the things that are going maybe the more negative aspects of those things but we use that to our benefit we we were able to you know julian talks about this kind of black box effect when we're talking about the design and iteration and it when it feels like we're not having that consistent support you know going back to that firefighter mentality we're not always sure what's being done when it's being done but if we're there and maybe we're providing more kind of consistent level of support we're involved in conversations we have visibility we can kind of keep tabs on what's going on yeah and it's being involved that brings all those uh, opportunities Right. Mm -hmm. um, and, and yeah, yeah, leveraging activities that they already do is a very good uh, entry point that uh, you used uh, on Rainbow Six and that we used on other uh, productions uh, as well. And that opened up like possibilities to, uh, hey, uh, OK, so we've done a couple of play sessions and we see that 
uh, several times people complain about this, but we don't know exactly why. And then you say, hey, we could we could help go to dig deeper into this. We could have, I don't know, a, a small internal uh, test session, usability test session with people that are outside of the production and start digging uh, about this. Or I don't know, maybe uh, maybe they are uh, they express concern about their target audience and they don't they they have missing information about the target audience. Then we could do some exploratory research and uh, interview the target audience and get some insights. So again, it's 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 really I mean, it's it's a it's a virtuous circle really. It's yeah. the more the more you're part of the discussions, and the more it becomes like obvious in a way uh, mm -hmm. where you can be helpful and even on productions that may be reluctant because you may you may have those ideas but uh, maybe the the, the, the the for uh, some reason the productions won't really let you do that or say oh no we don't do that etc because sometimes they don't understand the value that they can get out of it yeah. uh, I, I think another good tip that has been used <laughs> not only in the game user research industry in the past is just do it for free do your research for yeah. free and bring them some results I mean um, um, yeah, I, I, I remember uh, we, we had in the past a production that was uh, really reluctant to uh, use our research and it took one test to completely flip their, or one research to completely flip, flip their mindset because they had this kind of uh, idea of maybe, yeah, the validator thing, probably the validator yeah. thing, uh, by the way, and then they say, oh, but they can actually bring us different kind of insight and once they get that once and they get the really the value out of it, mm -hmm. then then it opens up a completely different collaboration. But of course, you still have to be listening a lot because you don't want to miss that first step. So you yeah. don't because you need to be relevant, but be relevant once and then uh, the, the, the door is maybe not fully open, but it's way more yeah. open than it was uh, before. For sure. And it's it's being very mindful about the strategy of these research the you know the research strategy alongside the production strategy or the conception or anything it's really understanding how we can complement that process it's not losing our own identity into there it's ensuring that we're able to provide the insights when they matter and be able to be in part of those conversations and recognizing that if we're looking at like, okay, well, there's a gate, you know, this month, and then in three months, there's another gate, I'm going to do a test before and a test before the next one. That also makes it very clear that you have, you know, two and a half months of in between time that you can get very creative, you can take time to sit and talk with them, listen, provide reviews of past research that has been done to be able to do competitive analysis, any sort of different aspects of you know, providing information to just kind of facilitate conversation and kind of fight that the, the black box of being kind of shut out from all of that and being and the anxiety. Of, yes, and the anxiety yes. on the production side, because I mean, uh, it's, it's it makes a difference between, uh, hey, we just pop out of the blue and we are going to assess yeah. your game versus uh, we work together for all these months to make sure that this gate where we need to have a test and we need to make this assessment is going to go uh, as well as it possibly can because uh, we try to feed you with information to make the right decision to prepare for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. I think, so I want to touch on an interesting aspect of this kind of relationship building, getting to the point of being blended, uh, because obviously a lot has changed since Julian kind of gave this talk a couple of years ago, uh, the big one being COVID. <laughs> um, oh yeah, that thing. <laughs> that one little thing, um, because I think it's, you know, when we're talking about embedded and being blended and things like that, you know, we're talking about these opportunities of like, oh, I'm walking by a designer's desk. Oh, hey, like, what are you working on? How are things going? Like, what are you up to? Like, what's what's happening? Or even just walking by someone's desk and seeing a stand up meeting and going over and joining. Right. There's a lot of this. A lot of our day to day life has changed. Right. Like I was an analyst pre COVID. So I have a lot of this ways of kind of how I was handling things. And now in the, the COVID era of, of the, our work, I have my analysts that are trying to manage this now in, okay, well, I don't get to just like see what they're working on. It's very different. And so I actually asked them, 
you know, hey, let's all, let's have a conversation. Like, how do we, so a good half, a portion of my team was here pre-COVID. Uh, a good portion of the team has joined uh, post-COVID or during, I don't know if we're, every, we're, we're current COVID times, I guess. Still. <laughs> 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 and it's, it's still difficult to have a coffee chat these days. Yeah, exactly. You can't really uh, see people a lot of face-to-face. -face. Majority, so for context, um, we are still very much remote. Uh, I know that there are other studios around the globe that are potentially doing more in-person research, but we do have some of our individuals who work in the office. We do have some individuals on design teams and production teams that are in the office, but for the most part, we are still working remote. Our, our research is remote, we're running online tests, and we can probably do a whole other episode um, of how we manage remote testing, but obviously, you know, a lot of our analysts right now don't have the luxury of just walking by someone's desk and saying, hey, what are you doing? Social distancing, maybe they're not in the office, all these different things. So, you know, I asked them, you know, what has changed when it comes to building these relationships, becoming blended, um, you know, and for better or for worse. And there was a lot of conversation about, like, documentation where there is a lot more kind of written documentation available, at least for a lot of the teams that they're working with and how that's been super helpful for them to prepare more meaningfully to go into conversations and be more efficient because they don't have to just rely on like catching that one person at their desk that one day when they had some free time is because majority of us are working remotely a lot more kind of time is being put into design documentation. And so it's been a, it's been easier for them to do some of their homework about where, where we have been, what decisions already have been made, what changes have been made to, to the design. So the researchers are coming in much more informed when they're going into discussions more often because they're able to find that information or they're at least feeling much more confident in being able to go in and ask the right questions to reduce the time of kind of spinning wheels of like, oh yeah, well that's just, that's in the design documents. You know, you can go find that somewhere. So I think that was something that was kind of interesting for a lot of them is just how a custom we've all had to become to having information available and it definitely has made things a lot better. I think some things that some of them mentioned to me about different strategies that they've had to kind of build relationships a little bit more efficiently was changing the way that we deliver findings. Um, there's a, the tendency to kind of have this kind of one catch-all report with all of our findings and delivering that over to our stakeholders. Uh, but what some of them are finding is that it actually is much more um, efficient and kind of keeps the conversation going when they can have more kind of a quick ad hoc meeting, like right after a test, discuss some high level findings, have a discussion with the team, and then have, you know, maybe a top findings, a more condensed report, and then maybe something that comes a little bit later. But they're trying to find strategies to kind of keep the conversation going. So they don't see them, you know, just up on the floor at their desk. And so they're specifically scheduling like, 15 minute meetings to go over some initial things, keeping the conversation going, letting them know, hey, I'm here. I ran this research. This is a thing that we did. So they're not not seeing us as well. Yeah, that's interesting to uh, see that this is happening now uh, with the, the, the remote setting uh, when it maybe was not happening so much uh, with the in-person, but uh, that's good. I hope this is habits that are going to uh, carry over the return to, 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 to the office because they are definitely uh, good habits. I'm, I'm wondering if, if this is something that uh, your uh, team talked to you about because, of course, I'm even uh, further from the operations that you are uh, <laughs> now. Um, but I, I would tend to believe that uh, because you uh, you don't have all these informal or casual, you know, meetings that uh, you could have, that 
does it doesn't make it even more important to be invited at the right meeting because if you're not at that meeting there's no chance that you hear about it at the coffee machine you know yep. uh, i'm just wondering if you had any uh, insight from your team about that yeah i think a couple of them kind of mentioned something similar to that where especially some of our newer folks have struggled to kind of find more casual ways to get to know people it's been difficult for them to sometimes make their way into the inner circle <laughs> of the production team because yeah there's not this opportunity to just walk by and introduce yourself either uh, things feel a lot more formal right for like for better or for worse and so yeah there is that pressure where it's like oh well you know were you invited to that play session it's it feels like when i was chatting with one of my analysts today it feels a little bit like you have to do a little bit more work to like get that invite to something, whereas maybe we didn't have to do that as much before. And so, you know, going back into this idea that we're providing, you know, quicker, snappier insights as, as frequently as we can, kind of keeping keeping them thinking about us and kind of keeping them thinking like, hey, we're here because, yeah, it's not as common to just be like, oh, yeah, you know what? I'm just going to swing by Lainey's desk. I see her there. I'm going to go chat with her and we're going to have this quick little conversation they're not getting that same level. And so they do have to put in a, a decent amount of extra work to really foster those relationships to be able to be in. And I think that it is it is much more difficult because mm. you you miss that casual nature of some of the like kind of water cooler or coffee coffee chats. Yeah, that's interesting yeah, that you are mentioning the, the, the PlayStation because we were talking earlier about the PlayStation and how we could help moderate them, etc. But uh, uh, just participating in them is, is it can, yes. can be some help. And, and especially these days with the, the, the COVID situation, you know, uh, uh, I remember a, a couple of months ago, we had a newcomer and I was talking to uh, someone on the production they were uh, working on and I was saying, oh, is it go how is it going, etc. And you thought, yeah, it's going great, but uh, uh, they, uh, they, they should do a little more effort to Get themselves known by the production, and that person was telling me uh, they, they they should they should just join our play session and just play the game with us, you know, just so that people see that hey, you're interested in the game and uh, you're playing the game and you're getting yourself known as someone who enjoys the project before being a, a user researcher, and that's I think that's that that. that that's something that is super important, no matter the situation. But uh, since, yeah, playing PlayStation is thankfully something that we can still do remotely, that's kind of a casual activity that is available now and that, uh, yeah, we could probably leverage to uh, yes. foster that, you know, or get that initial relationship uh, with yes. the people we are working with. For sure. And I think that segues like really perfectly into the next topic that I wanted to discuss a little bit. It's like, you know, like, how do we put this into practice, right? Like, how do we become blended? How do we build these relationships? And, you know, I think touching back to the to the talk from Julian, he does specifically mention play sessions and how we managed to do that was exactly the situation you were describing. It was just us initially showing up and playing with the team to try and like, hey, here we are, like what's going on? Trying to keep up to date, trying to learn the game, trying to just have our presence known. And that like evolved to us really taking over that process, implementing a lot of processes, teaching the teams how to run more efficient, more effective play sessions, getting the feedback that they needed. And for a couple of years, we were very, very implicated in the play sessions. It was within the last couple of years now that we've moved away from doing that. But that was really the kind of springboard for, I mean, and that was during my time when I was on the project is really getting people to know me, being able to get to know the designers, being able to kind of really empathize with them on what was going on. And it really was a fairly easy and like cheap way <laughs> of getting involved and really being able to kind of become a part of things and that really did allow me specifically and also the other analysts that I was working with be able to build our partnerships and our relationships with the team and get that more kind of global influence through giving them like a very easy thing that they were very accustomed to right 
most of our teams are probably running their own internal play sessions. There's some quick wins there for sure to be able to come in and say, hey, like, let me just phrase some questions for you, write a survey, do a quick little like write up of the of the discussion points. And that really led to us getting to the point where we weren't we were so busy doing so much research we couldn't actually facilitate running the play sessions anymore we we did end up dropping them at some point because we had so much other work because we were so implicated in all the design cycle through all the different seasons on siege we were so busy and i think it was a really interesting kind of evolution of how we used that to leverage our kind of that get that door open to coming in to with the team. Yeah, and uh, we did that on other projects as well, yes. and we keep doing that on other projects because that's a, that's an excellent entry point. Uh, I mean, um, I remember a couple of years ago uh, when uh, we we first uh, started to help on PlayStation just to gather production feedback on some of the and as you said yeah we know it's biased etc but it's still better than nothing and uh, uh truth be told the big issues that you get from there are usually issues that you want to take a look at you know it's not because it's the production yeah, that sure. uh, you should just disregard those and this is when we uh could do our very first internal usability test you know on very early features because we were exactly in that situation where at the same uh, comments were popping up again and again and again, and uh, we said, hey, we could do something else. Uh, you, you know this is happening, you don't know why, we can help you with that. And this is how we we, we, we got the ball rolling on that. So um, th there are other ways to do it, but PlayStation still is a very good way because, as you said, they are doing it anyways. So we are just bringing value uh, to an activity they are doing at absolutely no or very little extra effort uh, yeah. from them, so so that's a, that's a very good entry point to start building that uh, that collaboration. Uh, I was thinking about other ways uh, that um, we did build that, or that we could build that, or that we started uh, to 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 build that. Um, there's one I think you could you could you could speak about because uh, I think that's a very good one. You know, it's the, uh, uh, the 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 conversation that you started to have with this uh, very early production. You know, that was uh, mm, yeah. Uh, yeah. So maybe you want to <laughs> keeping say what, an because... NDA as much as possible. I'm like mm, yes. <laughs> yeah, you know that one that I cannot yeah. talk about. But uh, yeah, yeah, I no. think you can talk about the experience because that's a very good example, I believe. Yeah, for sure. I think to give as much context as I can. Um, I had done a lot of really interesting research during my time on Siege and really understanding, you know, there, there's there's talks about it online, the learning study, uh, this very, you know, discussed uh, piece of research that we did back with Siege of learning how players learned the game. And we spent a lot of time and we've done a lot of research building off of that in the last kind of however many years now. and really thinking about how players are are learning these kind of tactical shooter games or just kind of shooter games in general games that have a lot of kind of complex variables pvp and we really kind of were able to take a step back and provide some kind of high level information for a game that was like so so early in conception <laughs> like still initial conversations and we were able to go in and I was able to present to them a lot of the the research that we had done kind of years and years ago on Siege to help kind of inform them on like, hey, here's some of the pitfalls and some of the things that we experienced. If you're doing something similar to these mechanics or this specific kind of aspect of the game, here's some things that you should consider. And yeah, I mean, that was a, a really, inexpensive way it just took a couple of hours of my time to go sit and kind of run a little bit of a workshop with them they brought to me some ideas of hey we were thinking about doing this i was able to even go back and find even past pieces of research and i wasn't doing any new research this was all something that had been done years ago and it was just kind of digging that out of my memory bank and the kind of online wiki of here's some different examples and some different things to consider and yeah, it was a great way of kind of segueing into 
different conversations and being very implicated at a very early stage when there was nothing playable, nothing more than just some documentation and some storyboarding and being able to kind of influence those decisions very early on. Yeah, and what best way to uh, introduce a researcher that would later work on such production than to help them when they don't even have something that you can play with, right? Uh, I think it's important because it's also, uh, I mean, uh, it, it also means how important, and that might be, uh, we can develop on that on another talk, but how important it is to uh, also learn from our research, not, not just only delivering uh, what the production needs at a certain point, but, you know, um, uh, like um, aggregating our research and saying, okay, what do we know about these topics and these topics, etc.? because if we can really have developed uh, uh, broader expertise that is research-based and that uh, it can contribute to very early be uh, meaningful and insightful to uh, production teams, I think it's a very nice way to start building that collaboration. 100%. Mm -hmm. I think it's, you know, I think we talked about it in the communication episode, like doing less research. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, and it's like, it's really thinking meaningfully, you know, if you're, if you've got a team that's really early on thinking about research, even that you've done or other games have done, you know, there are ways of coming in and really showing where your value is and what you can add to the team and becoming that, you know, becoming blended by being able to help kind of provide information and just being that kind of empathetic support for the team. Yep, absolutely. So uh, we're getting running. We're running to the end of time. So I'm gonna yeah, gonna that's right. Because I a was saying, we could discuss <laughs> other example, but I was watching time. Ah, not sure. Maybe it's another time. <laughs> we'll have to get back to those other examples at another time. So if people are really interested, um, drop us a line. Let us know. I think we could probably chat about that for many, many days. But I think. I want to get kind of your your final your final takeaways, you know, so what are some of the most important steps towards moving towards a, a blended relationship with our design teams? Don't rush into the testing room. Try to understand your context first. I think that's great. <laughs> <laughs> that was like much shorter than I was expecting. <laughs> no, I mean, I think that's good. I think uh, it's yeah, it's, it's really taking the time to understand, you know, I've said this so many times, I think many times in the podcast, my team is probably very sick of me saying it. It's just take time to listen, you know, stay curious, understand what they're going through, what questions they have. It's not all about, it's not always about coming in and providing answers and giving the information. It's just as important to be able to come in and be able to help ask the right questions to facilitate that conversation. It's thinking about supporting consistently, having that consistency with your presence, the consistency of what you're able to kind of be a part of these conversations. And again, like you were saying, it's not rushing into the test room. It's not focusing only on these all encompassing tests that are really big. They really can contribute to that anxiety when expectations are not managed well. And yeah, not focusing solely on just getting in that test room as quickly as possible. Think about other ways of, you know, research reviews, um, competitive analysis, or just even past research that has been done or being able to run internal studies, play sessions, anything like that. And I think one of the most important things that I always tell for my team is acting as a facilitator of the discussion, not just thinking about yourself as I'm here presenting a piece of research. It's really about facilitating a conversation and how that can really help to lead you to the point where you're able to be a part of that decision making process. Yeah, and uh, when it comes to, 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 to reporting, I mean, uh, if you have the chance to organize some workshops and to facilitate those workshops, uh, that, that, that's a great way because, of course, we need to be before to understand what the needs are, but we need to be thereafter to see how they make the decisions because otherwise we fall into the uh, iteration black box thing. But uh, yes. doing the workshop is basically building the table to which you want to be present. So uh, that's a great way of being part of those uh, decision-making discussions. I think that that was the perfect way to end this. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you very much. It's always it's always nice to to have the time to to sit and chat with these things. I think it's really interesting and it's it's always helpful to reflect on kind of how our team has grown and, you know, kind of 
how we can continue to to build off of some of the really good things that we've discovered that work really well for our teams and sharing those with others. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, yeah, I hope we had, I wish we had more time, but that's right. <laughs> so I'll, I'll see you uh, next time. <laughs> Thanks, I'll see you next time. Bye, Laini. Thank you. All this is possible thanks to our sponsors, Playtest Cloud, Play Your Research, Balsamic, Adobe, the book How to Be a Games User Researcher, UX is Fine, Antidote, and Sketch.